The woman known to history as Wallace Simpson was born Bessa Wallace Warfield in Blue Ridge Summit, Pennsylvania, around the 19th of June, 1896. However, the exact date of her birth is somewhat unclear, as there is no birth certificate for Simpson, and there are no contemporary records of her birth in newspapers. Her father was Tickle Wallace Warfield, and her mother was Alice Montague. The name they gave their daughter was an amalgamation of the name of her Aunt Bessie and her grandfather's friend, Seven Tickle Wallace. This was soon abandoned, however, as, in her words, it was only fit for a cow. She preferred Wallace for its androgynous character and its distinctiveness. Blue Ridge, the site of her birth, was a crossroads between counties in both Pennsylvania and Maryland, and straddles the Mason-Dixon line. This fact permitted her an identity which spanned both the northern and southern United States, a fact which she often made use of during her later social life. Simpson's parents, cagey and vague as she herself recalled, likely married as a result of an unplanned pregnancy and had a quiet ceremony in 1895, just seven months before she was born. Her family originated from the Maryland upper middle class, with southern sympathies which had manifested themselves during the American Civil War, after which the family had gained considerable wealth in the Baltimore banking scene. However, her father, Tekel, had developed tuberculosis and had been unable to gain such wealth working as a lowly clerk in the Continental Trust, his uncle's bank. He died five months after the birth of his daughter, appearing in only a single photograph with her, sitting in a wheelchair. Baltimore, where Wallace grew up, was one of the fastest growing cities in the United States at the time and was increasingly attractive to the upper middle classes who erected large homes around the area of Mount Vernon. Baltimore's location on the coast allowed it to make a speedy recovery from the Civil War, and it was home to a significant immigrant community, which formed one-third of its overall population. After the death of her father, Wallace and her mother moved in with Anna Warfield, her grandmother on her father's side, in a large brownstone house near the monument in Baltimore. Anna took her granddaughter shopping every Saturday, which she described later with fondness, recalling that it was as exciting as a trip to the moon. Wallace, her mother and grandmother, also shared the house with another member of the family, Uncle Sol, Solomon Warfield, a financier and politician with ambitions for public office in the city, who financed her and her mother, but was a cruel and controlling influence, and Wallace and her mother soon moved back to the Brexton Hotel, where they had lived at the time of her birth. The two experienced emotional and financial turmoil at this time, and would spend solitary days, her mother selling embroidery at the local women's exchange shop. However, they were soon after invited to live with Aunt Bessie Merriman, her mother's sister, who had also just been widowed. Whilst living with her Aunt Bessie, Wallace attended school, first at Miss O'Donnell's school and then at the Arundel School on St. Paul Street, which provided her with a fairly basic but still important routine and which allowed her to learn how to read and write. This early education was funded by Uncle Sol, to whom she had to deliver her school reports. Wallace then attended Oldfields, the most expensive school in the city, where she fell in love with basketball and played under the supervision of Charlotte Noland, a young teacher whom Wallace later described as a mixture of gay, deft teasing and a drill sergeant's sternness, a dashing figure in every setting. The school fostered an old-fashioned approach to academic and social education and employed an honour system whereby students were required to confess to their own wrongdoing. Wallace reportedly misbehaved by smoking and by jumping from a balcony in order to meet a boy 
and was regarded by her classmates as somewhat of a ringleader, remembered for her independence and confidence. During her time at Oldfields, Wallace's mother had remarried to John Rassin, the son of the Democratic Party leader in Baltimore, who had the capacity to deliver financial stability to Wallace and her mother, but who never displaced Tico from the hearts of either woman. It was at this time that Wallace met a woman who was to become one of her greatest friends, Mary Kirk, a fellow student at Oldfields. Both girls were described as boy-crazy and far more interested in clothes than in school by Mary's older sister, Bucky. She also noted the propensity both had for attracting male attention and remarked that the two would be immediately surrounded by boys at any party they attended. In spring 1914, Wallace graduated from Oldfield School, signing her name in the yearbook with the message, All is Love, after which she and Mary became debutantes, albeit with restricted grandeur owing to the looming war in Europe, in respect to which excess was seen as bad form. Culture, at the time, dictated that before she could be released out as a debutante, Wallace would have to host her own party, which, after the death of her stepfather, John Rassin, in 1913, would have to be funded by Uncle Sol. He refused, citing the war in Europe as an excuse, and she was left to accept invitations to other debutante events thrown by her friends and, in some capacity, rivals. It was at this time that Wallace's grandmother died and the family entered a period of prolonged mourning. Wallace escaped this social inertia by moving to stay with her cousin Corin Mustin in Florida, who lived close to the site of a U.S. naval aviation facility, which afforded Wallace access to the dashing young officers who flew there. Wallace arrived in Pensacola, Florida in April 1916, aged 19, and within a day had written to her mother, announcing that she had met the world's most fascinating aviator. Lieutenant Earl Winfield Spencer Jr., eight years older than Wallace, was the object of her attention. He was an experienced pilot with six years' experience in the Navy. Wynn was well regarded in the Navy and was the 20th pilot in the US Navy to win his wings. Within weeks of their meeting, Wynn asked Wallace to marry him, to which she instantly agreed, but on the condition that she got the approval of her family first. Five months later, the two were formally engaged and had their engagement party hosted at the Baltimore Country Club. On the 8th of November 1916, the two were married against a turbulent political background of constant talk of entering the war in Europe. This had dominated the US presidential election, which had concluded just before, with most Americans sustaining the belief that whilst they should support the British and the French, they should keep their troops out of the conflict. The honeymoon for the newlyweds was split between West Virginia and New York, where Wallace had a first encounter with her new husband's alcoholism. On one occasion, Wynne flew into a rage when he was unable to obtain drink in the dry state of West Virginia. Shortly after this incident, the couple returned to Florida, where Wynne was an instructor at the Navy Flight School, and Wallace embarked on the ritual existence of the housewife, entertaining other Navy wives at her home, and learning how to paint. In April 1917, the U.S. joined the war and the couple moved to Boston, where Wynne was the commander of the Naval Aviation School at Squantum. He had been effectively grounded and saw the move as a form of demotion, causing him great anger and frustration, a response which manifested in a greater reliance on alcohol. For the next eight years, Wallace endured a troubled marriage with Wynne whom she had known hardly at all before their marriage and who was increasingly cruel and manipulative towards her. During his working hours, 
Wallace would wander the streets of Boston and attend court cases as a way of passing the time. And after a time, the couple moved again when Wynne was asked to establish a new flying school in San Diego. Wynne's anger mounted during the latter stages of the war and worsened when his brother, Dumeresque, was killed in action whilst flying in France. His younger brother was awarded the Croix de Guerre, aged 17 in the same theatre. His own comparative inaction was a source of immense jealousy and frustration, and Mary Kirk grew concerned that her friend was being abused by her husband. According to Wallace's later memoirs, Wynne became ever more abusive as he was passed over for promotion and prevented from entering any sort of combat zone. He would make her watch as he burned her family photographs and locked her in her room for hours on end. In 1920, the two decided that they should live apart for a time, although they moved back in together when Wynne was posted to Washington at the Bureau of Aeronautics. During this time, Wynne's abuse was sustained, and after one incident when he locked Wallace in the bathroom for a number of hours, she decided that she would divorce him, despite the immense social taboo that this constituted. She received no support from her family. Her mother and aunt both said that the plan was shameful and that she would stain the family name by being the first to undergo such a split. Wynne was soon posted to the Far East as a gunboat captain, and Wallace remained in the US, living with her mother from June 1921 and surviving on the $225 she received monthly from Wynne. In autumn 1922, Wallace moved into a Georgetown house with a friend, the wife of another naval aviator who was also posted to the Far East. Her friend was the daughter of an admiral. This gave Wallace a social status which afforded her the opportunity to make friends in high places, many of whom were unattached men. A scene which she described as a special paradise for a woman on her own. This environment honed her skills as a socialite, and Wallace made sure to be up to date with current affairs so that she could engage with these topics in the social circle she had entered, and when she was offered a trip to Paris with her cousin, she jumped at the chance and set sail in 1924. During her time in France, Wallace learned that her uncle Sol was unwilling to pay for her divorce, and when she received a letter from Wynne asking her to join him in the Far East, she agreed and arrived in Hong Kong a short time later in September 1924. On meeting Wynne, it seemed at first that the situation between them had been repaired. He informed her that he had stopped drinking and certainly appeared healthier and more self-controlled than when the two had last met. However, this was not to last, and within a couple of weeks, Wynne had returned to drinking and abuse caused in part by his suspicion of Wallace and his belief that she was flirting with other men whilst he was on duty. A short time later, Wallace informed Wynne that this second attempt at marriage was over and that she would be leaving him for good, a conclusion to which he offered no resistance. She then travelled alone to Shanghai which was in a state of tension after the founding of the Communist Party there in 1921. The city had been under the control of the British since 1842, and the conclusion of the Opium War, a lease which had led to great tension between the British occupiers and the Chinese inhabitants. After a spell in Shanghai, Wallace travelled to Peking, on a journey that was interrupted several times by armed brigands and against the advice of the US consulate. She stayed with a family she had met in San Diego and wrote home ecstatically about her experiences in the city, which she found exotic and exciting. During her time in Peking, Wallace became acquainted with diplomats, military officers, and other influential persons, including the husband of Benito Mussolini's daughter, Galeazzo Ciano, 
She did not encounter any potential husbands, however, and returned to the United States after her Lotus Year in China, arriving in Seattle in September 1925. After she returned to the US, Wallace visited her mother and then went to stay in Virginia, where she hoped to gain a formal divorce. She wrote to Wynne, asking that he send a letter confirming that he had deserted her and that they had not been in contact with one another for the previous three years. Obviously a mistruth, since they had met in China. However, Wynne was willing to backdate his letter so that it appeared the two had been separated for a greater period of time. Soon afterwards, in the latter months of 1927, her uncle Sol died, leaving Wallace little more than a single room and a bond in the family bank. This snub occurred because of Sol's disapproval of Wallace's divorce, and he had effectively disinherited her as a result. In December 1927, she formally obtained a divorce from Wynne and was now a free woman. Wallace settled in New York, living with her friend Mary Kirk, who had married a glamorous French army veteran who had traveled to the US to train American troops. Wallace made some half-hearted attempts to find work, but lacked drive, relying instead on good fortune and the hope of a husband who would bring in a sizable income. Mary was often frustrated at Wallace's lack of proactivity and recalled that she rejected a job as a secretary owing to her disdain for the typewriter. During this period, Mary introduced Wallace to Ernest Simpson and his wife Dorothea. Despite the fact that he was married and a father, Ernest soon formed an attachment to Wallace and began to take her to art galleries and dinners. Wallace was certainly desperate for an income and a steady household and appreciated the learned and intellectual disposition that Ernest had, as well as his knowledge of classics and art. He lacked the same grandeur as the naval officers she had courted in Florida, however. He had shown considerable bravery in leaving Harvard, aged 21, to join the Coldstream Guards and fight in the First World War before the US had formally entered the conflict. Although he was never actually deployed to the front line, he still wore his guard's tie most days. Simpson had adopted what he considered to be a British attitude towards life and remained financially austere and stiff upper lipped. Despite his Jewish heritage, his son later recalled that he would hide this part of his character and was even casually anti-Semitic at the dinner table. Indeed, his son was only made aware of his heritage after Ernest had died. In July 1928, Wallace wrote to her mother that the best and wisest thing for me to do is to marry Ernest. I am very fond of him and he is kind, which will be a contrast. I can't go on wandering for the rest of my life and I feel so tired of fighting the world all alone and with no money. Later that month in London, Wallace and Ernest married in a registry office in Chelsea, which both described as a dreary setting for a wedding, proceeding to the Grosvenor Hotel for the reception. Afterwards, Ernest and Wallace traveled to France for their honeymoon. This was an immensely happy period and Wallace wrote that Ernest was a splendid guide and that he cared for her and gave her a sense of security that she had not felt since childhood. After their return, Wallace attempted to gain influence in British social circles, initially with limited success. The novelist Barbara Cartland described her as aggressively American and recalled that she told us rather vulgar stories and I was shocked to the core. Wallace also struggled with the new social dynamics and setting of life in London, stating that there was an essential difference in the status between men and women in Britain, which was not the case in her experiences in America. In the US, she and the other wives of naval officers had proactively fought for their husband's status and promotion, whereas British women 
despite their formidable power in their own sphere, were still accepting the status of a second sex. In 1929, Wallace was informed that her mother was gravely ill, and she traveled back over the Atlantic to find her in a coma. She died on the 2nd of November and had nothing in her possession, her savings having been eliminated by the Wall Street crash. Wallace was deeply angered and upset at this injustice and returned to London with the intention of distracting herself by throwing all of her energies into the decoration and maintenance of their new home. This soon afforded her a unique status, and she became known amongst London social circles for her parties, decor, and unusual manner of hosting. She leaned heavily into her southern heritage and offered up American food, for which she soon became known. Ever since she had arrived in London, Wallace had expressed a desire to meet Edward, the Prince of Wales. Edward was then aged 37, but retained a youthful appearance and a radiant charm which had made him the object of much attention. Edward had attended Osborne Naval College before going up to Magdalen College, Oxford, which he left before graduating and on the outbreak of the First World War, Edward joined the Grenadier Guards, although he was prevented from entering any dangerous combat zones. He had a difficult relationship with his father, King George V, and remained scared and resentful of him into adulthood. A resentment which grew when his father prevented him from being deployed to the front, even writing to Lord Kitchener, the Secretary of State for War, begging to be allowed to go although he was yet again let down when Kitchener informed him that the greatest danger was not his death, but his capture. This period seems to have had a marked effect on the prince, and his diaries reveal that he was depressed and battled with a hatred of his own appearance, often refusing food and exercising excessively. He also demonstrated many nervous behaviors and obsessed about his physical appearance in a way which would possibly now be described as anorexic. Edward was often described as erratic and would cause his staff a great deal of stress when on tour. He would arrive late to official functions and when telegrammed that his father was seriously ill, he laughed and claimed that it was a joke concocted by the then Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin as an electoral dodge. Wallace and Edward had their first encounter in January 1931 as a result of a mutual friend, Thelma Furness, who invited both for a week of fox hunting in Leicestershire. Wallace was highly nervous beforehand and had requested etiquette lessons from another friend before embarking on the event, although once she had arrived, her naturally forward character had made itself known she criticized the prince for talking to her about seemingly conventional topics and asked that he make a greater effort. Some weeks passed before the two met again, although Wallace was pleased when the prince recognized her at their second meeting in May. Wallace was later introduced to the court alongside Ernest, who dressed for the occasion in his guard's uniform. They once again met the Prince of Wales, who had made a comment under his breath that something had to be done about the lights as they made all the women look ghastly. When Edward later complimented Wallace on her dress, she retorted, but sir, I thought you said we all looked ghastly. In early 1932, Wallace entertained the prince at her home for the first time, for which she decided to serve a classic American menu of black bean soup, grilled lobster, fried chicken Maryland, and a raspberry souffle. The prince stayed until four in the morning and asked for several of Wallace's recipes. The evening was evidently a success, and Edward asked Wallace to join him for a weekend at his home. She and Ernest attended and were well received, although following this, Ernest was increasingly concerned at his wife's habits. He was working ever harder in the city whilst she had a growing desire to throw more and more extravagant parties which he was struggling to afford. However, from mid-1932 
the couple were increasingly invited to the home of the Prince of Wales. This was ostensibly for the purpose of chaperoning her friend, Thelma Furness, who was the girlfriend of Edward at that time. Wallace, as a married woman, was to act as the invigilator of their interactions as a third party. Meanwhile, Wallace and Ernest became increasingly detached from one another. Ernest working longer hours and often required to travel overseas for work. Wallace nurtured her relationship with the prince, which he evidently valued in return, throwing a birthday party for her 37th birthday, to which she responded in kind by purchasing him a monogrammed matchbox and inviting him to an Independence Day party at her home. In January 1934, Thelma Furness sailed for the United States, leaving Edward without her. Wallace and Ernest were increasingly separated, and she spent more time with the Prince than ever before, although she was slightly taken aback at the volume of attention he demanded from her, phoning her multiple times in a single day and inviting himself to their flat. Wallace was worried about the state of her marriage and professed many times in letters that she was concerned about losing Ernest, whom she valued and loved as a source of stability and security. When she was invited by the prince to attend Ascot with him, her aunt wrote a strongly worded letter to Wallace decrying the behavior of Edward and reminding her what this would communicate to Ernest. Edward made it increasingly clear that Wallace had displaced Thelma and, upon her return from America, would avoid her and make pains to be charming to Wallace, even when Thelma and Ernest were both present. The prince cruelly dismissed his former sweetheart and isolated himself from many of his former companions, allowing only Wallace's phone calls to be put through. In November 1934, the prince expressed a desire to present Wallace to his parents at Buckingham Palace. She arrived wearing jewels that he had given her and was introduced to the king and queen. She failed to make a good impression and was banned from attending Silver Jubilee events and the Royal Box at Ascot. Undeterred, Edward invented new ways to spend time with Wallace inviting her to ski with him in Austria in February 1935. She agreed without asking Ernest, who was instead forced to remain at home and watch the love affair between his wife and the prince emerge on the public stage. Wallace was evidently aware of this and wrote to the prince afterwards explaining that she was concerned about the relationship she had with him and that she thought he spent too long at her flat and thoughtlessly trod on his relationships with Thelma and his other friends. She pleaded with him to make things a little easier for me. He replied to this request with more money and gifts, which sapped her capacity to leave. Scandalized servants reported around this time that Wallace's rooms at his home had been extended to include a wardrobe which connected to his own allowing unfettered access between them without either person having to emerge. This caused a minor crisis when it was rumored around the household that Edward was a liar, he had sworn to his father that Wallace was not his mistress, and an adulterer. By October 1935, the letters exchanged between Wallace and the prince were openly romantic and he made no pretense about his desire to marry her. One letter ran, I love you more and more every minute and no difficulties or complications can possibly prevent our ultimate happiness. On the 20th of January, 1936, the king died, hastened to his end by the administration of morphine and cocaine injected by the royal physician, Lord Dawson, in order that his death be timed to be printed in the morning papers. Edward was now king, and both Wallace and Ernest wrote separately to him to console him and to offer their services to their new monarch. Subsequent events deeply involved Wallace, who was given a prominent seat when the ascendancy of Edward VIII was announced, 
and later rode with him in his car. Crowds reportedly bowed as they assumed that she was the Duchess of Kent from a distance, but soon realized that it was Wallace who remained next to the king. Official engagements and social gatherings which involved Edward now also intimately involved Wallace. Her easygoing attitude and position made her even more of a spectacle. Wallace routinely asked guests to dress down for dinner and made it clear that guests who arrived late would incur no sort of social repercussion. Noel Coward remarked in a letter that he was sick to death of having quiet suppers with the King and Mrs. Simpson. Many guests to these gatherings were interested and sometimes indignant at the dynamic in the relationship which had emerged between Edward and Wallace. She often commanded him and reprimanded him in front of guests. One instance saw her tease him on his decision to have his documents read to him rather than reading them himself. Prime Minister Baldwin became increasingly concerned about the attitudes of the new king to matters of state. He often left state papers unread and failed to form his own opinions of current events, preferring to defer to those of others. Wallace also had access to state papers which he would leave around for her to read, and she became in many ways a confidant of his. Eventually, Baldwin decided that only papers which required the signature of the king should be sent to him. Events in Europe had taken a dramatic turn during the year of 1936. Adolf Hitler had invaded the Rhineland in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, and in July, a protracted campaign against the fascist coup of General Franco had erupted in Spain. The king was professionally absent, his sole focus being to marry Wallace. The Davidson Memorandum, produced in 1936 by Lord Davidson and circulated to cabinet officials, described Wallace as a gold digger and posed the solution that if Ernest and she could be convinced to return to America, then they could avoid the risk of her becoming queen. The memorandum closed by stating, Mrs. S is very close to Leopold von Hirsch and has, if she likes to read them, access to all secret and cabinet papers. This latter part of the memorandum shows evident concern that Wallace could pass secrets and sensitive information to Germany, Leopold von Hirsch being the incumbent ambassador. George VI later wrote to the Prime Minister that, I must tell you quite honestly that I do not trust Wallace's loyalty. Wallace was indeed courted by several senior Italian and German officials and lunched with Joachim von Ribbentrop, Hitler's special envoy. Friends of Wallace's stated that he called upon her every day he had in London and always sent her a large box of flowers whenever he had to leave. During this period, Mary Kirk, a dear school friend of Wallace, had evidently taken pity on Ernest, given his effectively ended marriage, and she soon professed in private that she was in love with him. Wallace was upset at the sight of her husband becoming closer with her friend, but given the circumstances, she could hardly be surprised. It was an open secret that their marriage was over, and he was privately referred to as the master of the mistress. Wallace and the king would also host lavish dinners to which only the most exalted guests were invited. On one such occasion in May, the King and Wallace hosted the Prime Minister and his wife, Stanley and Lucy Baldwin, Admiral of the Fleet Sir Ernley Chatfield, as well as the aviator Charles Lindbergh and his wife, Anne. In July, Ernest was in Paris and booked a hotel room alongside a female companion who gave the name Buttercup Kennedy. When he returned home, he found a letter from Wallace in which she informed Ernest that she was to sue for divorce. He had evidently been followed by someone in communication with Wallace and, upon reading her letter, moved out of their home and took up residence in the Guards Club. This process having been started, 
Wallace and the King planned a holiday together. Edward wanted to travel to Spain, but was advised not to on the grounds that the Spanish Civil War was still underway. I really am annoyed with the Foreign Office for having messed up my holiday in this stupid manner, he wrote to his mother. The pair instead planned to travel down the Dalmatian coast in a yacht, which was to be flanked by two Royal Navy destroyers. At home, the matter of divorce remained highly controversial and taboo. Fewer than 5,000 couples a year legally separated, and until 1937, it was only permitted in the event that a wife sought a divorce from her husband if he had committed adultery. If both wife and husband had committed adultery, then the law bizarrely precluded either from obtaining a divorce. The king was expected not only to keep the law, but to exemplify an ideal, a matter which was highly problematic given his love for Wallace. Some letters published after the fact have suggested that Wallace was subject to coercion from Edward during this period, that he had informed her that if she left him, he would commit suicide. Wallace was evidently in a tricky situation and continued to write to Ernest in private that she missed him and lamented their separation. She described her own feelings of immense fear and entrapment in a situation she could no longer control. Indeed, the public and private situation had become ever harder for her to endure and she was subject to great opposition from the Duchess of York, who openly ignored her at gatherings, and from a press which increasingly antagonized the American harlot. In a letter penned to Ernest, she wrote, I have had so much trouble and complications with everyone. Also, I am terrified of court, etc., and the US press has done untold harm. I feel small, and licked by it all, she concluded the letter with, Love, Wallace, I am so lonely. Whilst the British press had abstained from printing much material about the couple, with the exception of Cavalcade, the US press had become obsessed with them and included photographs of Edward and Wallace in most daily newspapers. The trial for her divorce was a major focal point of their attention and was a largely embarrassing spectacle in which Ernest confessed that he had enjoyed bed and breakfast with Elizabeth Buttercup Kennedy, who was, in fact, Mary Kirk, her childhood friend. The whole case was concluded in 14 minutes, and Wallace dined that night with the King. During dinner, Edward informed her that he had spoken the week before, on the 20th of October, with Stanley Baldwin, confessing to him that he had a firm intention to marry Wallace. The Prime Minister was firmly opposed to the idea, but realized that duty limited him to advising the monarch alone. The position was well summarized by Violet Bonham Carter, daughter of the former Prime Minister, H. H. Asquith, who wrote that the King faced a dilemma that many human beings have had to face and meet with less at stake. The same line was not taken by many other parts of the British establishment, and it was reported by Lady Hilda Runciman that the British Legion had proclaimed, We could not stand the shock of the proposed marriage of the King and Wallace Simpson. This view echoed that of the wider church community, which was shocked at the prospect of such a union, and embarked on a program to remind the public of the benefits of a stable, unbroken marriage. Wallace faced increasing opposition from the aristocracy, the political classes and, as she was warned, the press, which she had been assured would not hold its breath about the matter for much longer. The prospect of their union was indeed presented as such a considerable issue that Stanley Bruce, the former Prime Minister of Australia, recalled that Baldwin and he had conversed, stating, the alarming and devastating possibility that the king should marry the woman, the people of this country and the dominions would never accept the woman as queen, quite possibly the House of Commons would cancel the civil list and the throne would be imperiled. 
the empire would be endangered, the government would resign, and it would be quite impossible to get an alternative government. The king soon after informed Baldwin bluntly that, I mean to abdicate and marry Mrs. Simpson, a proposal which he could simply not understand. Indeed, Wallace was still publicly claiming that she and the king were friends, but they had no intention of marrying one another. She continued to write to Ernest, professing her desire to return and live with him, and strongly suggesting that she felt totally out of control in a social and legal process which had carried her far from her intended destination. The situation for Wallace worsened progressively, and she was soon subject to violence. Rocks were thrown at her windows, she received letters written with poisoned ink, and there was a great concern amongst officials that she could be accosted. Baldwin even remarked that he feared some woman might shoot her, and she was unable to lead anything akin to a normal life, unable to go shopping or attend her favorite salon, amidst the bomb scares that constantly threatened her. In December 1936, it was determined that Wallace could not remain in England, and it was arranged that she should leave the country as soon as possible. An attack on the couple by Dr. A. W. F. Blunt, the Bishop of Bradford, had ignited the fury of the British press, who had soon after collectively decided to break the embargo they had applied to their own reporting. The final evening Wallace spent with Edward in England in 1936 was a painful one. The king was tearful and implored Wallace to call him when once she had left, regardless of the time. She left for France the same day and arrived at a hotel in Rouen at 5.15 a.m. the next morning. The car was pursued for much of the journey and Wallace was only able to snatch a couple of hours sleep before she and her driver continued. Conditions at home had changed so rapidly that Edward's plan to remain king after a planned public address had been demolished over a single weekend. He started to plan for his abdication, seeing this as the final remaining course of action which would permit him and Wallace to marry. Edward and Wallace communicated daily during this period and all correspondence to the palace via telephone had to be suspended for at least two hours for their use. The king was in a constant state of depression and thought of nothing but her calls. Although Wallace was concerned about his increasing insistence on abdication, issuing a statement from Cannes in which she said that she was anxious to avoid damaging his majesty or the throne. Indeed, Wallace's letters to friends indicate further that she was terrified of playing a part in a constitutional crisis in which the king would have to resign. The king's lawyer, Theodore Goddard, met with Wallace in France and recorded privately that she was definitely prepared to leave the king in order to avoid a crisis, although he was not prepared to give her up and was willing to abdicate in order to marry her. Wallace formally declared this willingness to Goddard and made it clear that her greatest desire was to leave the situation in which she found herself. On the 10th of December, 1936, fewer than six weeks after Wallace had divorced Ernest, the King signed the instrument of abdication at Fort Belvedere alongside his three brothers. Once this had been approved by Parliament, he would formally be regarded as a private citizen and gave a speech broadcast from Windsor Castle in which he expressed love for Wallace and his loyalty to the new king, his brother George. Winston Churchill compared the situation to that which had faced Charles I, an analogy echoed by Virginia Woolf. This concluded Edward, now the Duke of Windsor, left England aboard the HMS Fury. He was the first monarch since James II and the Anglo-Saxon kings Ein and Seelwulf to cede the throne, and had done so, as far as can be ascertained, owing 
to his love for Wallace. Wallace herself believed that she had been used by politicians as a way of removing a lazy and unstable monarch from power. This view was shared by many other politicians of the day, with David Lloyd George writing of his anger that Baldwin had managed to remove the monarch by actively calling attention to facts which made the king's position untenable. Wallace realized that she had become entangled in a position from which she had no hope of escape, and subsequently that she had become an exile. She was highly conscious of Edward's mental state, which made her feel ever more responsible and isolated. In a December letter to Ernest, she wrote, None of this mess is of my own making. I miss you and worry about you. I shan't live very long and am, in fact, a prisoner. Oh dear, wasn't life lovely, sweet and simple? The assault on Edward and Wallace was renewed the day after the abdication, on which the Archbishop of Canterbury, Cosmo Lang, decried Edward for giving in to a craving for private happiness and said in a speech broadcast on the BBC that it is sad that he should have sought his happiness in a manner inconsistent with the Christian principles of marriage. Lang was subject to intense criticism for his language, and many described him as a scold. Many other writers in publications such as The New Statesman described the event as a smashing clerical victory, although one which was unnecessary and invasive. There remained another pressure concerning how the former king was perceived, and Buckingham Palace was concerned that the Duke of Windsor, better looking, more adventurous and outgoing than the new king, would steal the limelight even after he had ceded the throne. Edward remained popular with some swathes of British society and received open support from the British Union of Fascists, the leader of which, Oswald Mosley, claimed that he was in direct communication with Edward and that he hoped to form a new government with the former king once again in office. Edward and Wallace were, by Christmas 1936, both in Europe, but remained apart. It had been decided that the two should not immediately be reunited, and so Wallace remained in France and Edward in Austria. Wallace wrote often to Ernest and expressed her boredom and frustration at the situation, as well as her great anger and upset at the publication of several biographies of her, which made several unfounded claims. She was also featured as a waxwork in Madame Tussauds, but was grouped away from the royals, and instead with Marie Antoinette and Joan of Arc. In early March 1937, Wallace left Cannes and travelled with her servant Mary Burke to the Loire Valley in central France to stay with Charles Bedeau, a self-made entrepreneur who had written on labour management and operations efficiency. Bedeau would later be accused of collusion with the Nazis and committed suicide prior to his trial for treason. He was already in the 1930s under surveillance from the US and British security services. However, a subsequent French government investigation actually found that he had worked to protect Jewish property and sabotaged German production lines. Edward, meanwhile, was engaged in planning the wedding for which he had given up so much. There was great concern that if any members of the royal family attended, it would undermine their position even more than it had done already. Edward was angered at this and wrote to his brother asking if he could help him procure a dignified setting for his marriage to Wallace, to which the king replied, saying that he greatly wished to help, but this was not simply a private matter. The only royal chaplain willing to host the ceremony was the vicar of St. Paul's Darlington, R. A. Jardine, a former street preacher who had, on occasion, claimed that he was a faith healer and who had agreed to perform the ceremony after he had undergone a religious experience in which he claimed to have heard a voice which commanded him to go to France 
and officiate the wedding. Others involved in the wedding preparations included the society florist Constant Spry, who had been a close contact and friend of Edward and who had missed out on a great deal of exposure and income from the coronation, which Wallace hoped to make up for by engaging her for their wedding. Besides those who had been engaged, relatively few guests had accepted invitations to the wedding, in large part due to their concern as to how this would affect their reputations at home. The wedding day itself was set for the 3rd of June, 1937, at the Chateau de Condé, the home of Charles Bedeau. Edward met Jardine that morning and shook his hand, saying, Thank God you've come. Pardon my language, but you're the only one who had the guts to do this for me. The altar for the ceremony was initially an oak chest, which had been dragged in from another room, although an alternative was obtained from a nearby church. For her third wedding, Wallace wore a pale blue crepe dress with a halo-style hat. The colour of her outfit was to become known as Wallace Blue, and was designed to match her eyes, which she further accented with sapphires made by Van Cleef and Arpels. Edward's best man was Edward Fruity Metcalf, his former equity to the Duke of Windsor when he was king and a close friend to Edward. On the wedding day, a letter from King George VI noted that after they had been married, Wallace would not be entitled to the honorific Her Royal Highness, which Edward bitterly described as a nice wedding present. Edward decided that he would, regardless, refer to Wallace as HRH and ordered that his household do the same, an arrangement which often caused confusion. Baba Metcalf, the wife of Fruity, noted that seven English people were present at the wedding of a man who, six months ago, was the King of England. The entire wedding party consisted of Fruity and Baba, Herman and Catherine Rogers, who were friends of Wallace, Walter Monckton, Edward's legal advisor and friend, Charles and Fern Beddo, their hosts at the castle, Aunt Bessie Merriman, Lady Selby, Dudley Forward, Edward's new equerry as the Duke of Windsor, and George Allen. Léon Blum, the French Prime Minister, sent a bouquet of flowers but the British government had no official influence or presence at the wedding whatsoever. Jardine, who had officiated the ceremony, returned to a parish and a country which loathed him, and he was soon forced to move to America. Many of the other guests risked their reputations, and Lady Selby had travelled without her husband, as his concern over the matter was too great and he decided not to attend as a result. So it was that Edward and Wallace were married. The Duke of Windsor had in many ways failed to acquire royal titles for his wife and to marry her at a dignified wedding ceremony. After the wedding, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor went on their honeymoon, which took them to the Corinthian mountains and Venice, which had been bedecked by flowers by Mussolini's fascist government. They continued traveling throughout Europe for a number of months and finished up in Paris, staying at the Hotel Maurice while searching for a home, settling first at a house in Versailles and then on the Boulevard Suchet. Their lives for this period were marked by isolation as well as a relatively aimless existence in which they had failed to find a defined purpose and could thus never escape the fact that they had been exiled. In the light of this, the invitation from Charles Bedeau to visit Germany, in which he had substantial business interests, was appealing. Edward was a lover of Germany and was open about his support for her people and even her government. The Austro-Hungarian ambassador had reported that, in 1933, Edward had expressed his remarkable sympathies for the Nazis in Germany. He naturally condemns the Treaty of Versailles. I hope that we shall never have to fight a war again, but if so, it will have to be on the winning side, and that will be the German. <laughs>
the chance of a visit to Germany also had the potential to offer Wallace the chance for a state visit and the reception which would be afforded to someone of her title. Edward and Wallace arrived in Berlin in early October and were greeted by a number of Nazi leaders at Friedrichstrasse station. They later met with Goebbels, Ribbentrop, Himmler and Hess. During their stay, they toured mines, youth camps and housing projects, the Duke relishing the chance to speak German and showing signs of evident enjoyment at the reception he had received in comparison to that which he had left behind. The most notable moment of the trip occurred when the Duke and Duchess met with Adolf Hitler in his mountaintop retreat, the Berghof. The visit came three days after Lord Halifax had expressed the desire to learn more about Hitler's expansionist aims and it furthered Hitler's belief that if he gained control of England, he could install the Duke and Duchess as a sympathetic party in power. To many, the image of Edward and Wallace beaming before Hitler and his uniformed guards was definitive of both. During this period, the relationship between Edward and his family entirely collapsed. He was well aware that his brother, his sister-in-law the Queen, and his mother were staunchly opposed to him returning in any capacity, whether for a prolonged period or even a brief stay. One letter penned by the Duke to his mother made his response incredibly clear. You and Bertie, by his ignominious capitulation to the wiles of his ambitious wife, have made further normal correspondence between us impossible. Churchill remained loyal to the former king and argued in favor of Edward and Wallace throughout the various meetings and political dramas which involved them. He also made a point to visit them in their new villa in Cap d'Antibes, which overlooked the Mediterranean. In the study was the desk that Edward had used to sign the instrument of abdication, which remained a permanent feature in any home that the couple lived in. Despite their surroundings, it was clear that the couple continued to feel that they were living in exile, and both of them expressed a desire to return to England. By 1939, this appeared more like a possibility, with one poll suggesting that 61% of the public desired the return of the Windsors, with 16% opposed. By August 1939, the prospect of conflict with Germany appeared acute, and the Duke and Duchess made plans to evacuate from France. Edward telegrammed Hitler at the end of the month and implored him to seek peace. Hitler replied simply that his attitude towards England remains the same. The next day, the two nations were at war with one another. At the beginning of September, plans were made to fly the Duke and Duchess out of France, although Edward complained that the aircraft proposed was too small and that he wanted all of his luggage to be returned with him. Metcalfe, his equerry, replied that they had behaved as two spoiled children. Women and children are being bombed while you talk of your pride. Eventually, Churchill sent a destroyer, HMS Kelly, under the command of Lord Louis Mountbatten. Churchill had arranged for a grand reception for them once they had arrived at Portsmouth, with soldiers standing guard to receive the Windsors once the ship had docked. The couple stayed for a few days at Metcalfe's London flat before returning to France, where the Duke had been posted to the British military mission and Wallace left to join a French relief organization, which she did as a member of the French Red Cross, delivering plasma, bandages and medical instruments to positions behind the Maginot Line. Once the Germans had breached the Maginot Line, the Duke and Duchess were once again advised to flee France and they travelled to Spain in May 1940, where they stayed at the expense of the government, a fascist regime under General Franco, despite the fact that he had become Prime Minister of a state on the brink of an invasion, Churchill wrote to ensure that the Spanish put up the Windsors in the greatest possible comfort, which they did 
giving them two rooms at the Ritz in Madrid. All the while, the Duke wrote home demanding that if he and Wallace returned, they should be received at Buckingham Palace and receive tax reimbursements from the civil list despite their considerable wealth. An exacting demand at the best of times, but downright poor form in the midst of such hardship within the wider public. Churchill, upon learning of Edward's desertion from duty in Paris, reprimanded him, and he was soon declared the new governor of the Bahamas. A collection of 29 islands with a population of 70,000 were regarded at the time as the most backward-looking of the colonies. The islands suffered from high unemployment and a dependence on American tourists and was commonly regarded as a punishment station for officials who had to be occupied and kept out of the way. The Duke and Duchess were dispatched to the islands and moved into the government house in Nassau, which was in a state of disrepair and was indeed semi-derelict. Wallace and Edward disliked the hot weather, but agreed that it was good for the figure. Certainly, neither openly complained about the situation, and Wallace engaged herself in work for the Red Cross, of which she was the local president. Visitors commented that she seemed genuinely concerned and friendly towards those she helped. In private, however, the couple were greatly concerned about their possessions, many of which they had left at home, and Edward contemplated a leave of absence from his position. However, this was met with outrage, and Churchill reprimanded the Duke for his idea, given that the people of Britain are suffering so much. Wallace reported in letters to Monckton that it was unfair for Edward to be governor of such a small place, given that he had formerly been the King of England, and expressed again her belief that the government was persecuting them. Wallace lamented in her personal notes her new station, which she compared with Napoleon's exile to Elba, describing the islands as a dump, and stating bluntly that we both hate it. The couple made several visits to the US against the wishes of the British government and enjoyed somewhat greater popularity in the American press as a result, and were received by large and jubilant crowds in Washington, New York, and Baltimore. Mary Kirk, now Ernest's wife and the former best friend of Wallace, had developed cancer in 1940, and knowing that she did not have long to live, expressed a desire to see her child, who had been evacuated to North America. Churchill remembered the willingness of Ernest during the divorce process and managed to arrange a government plane to fly the couple to the US. After Mary had died, Wallace wrote to Ernest and offered her services to him in whatever way she could be of help. Meanwhile, life in the Bahamas dramatically changed after the Japanese attack on the US naval base of Pearl Harbor, with a significant number of troops and airmen now stationed on the islands from Coastal Command. Wallace spent a great deal of time working to fix up an RAF mess and attended her Red Cross duties early each morning, her work having taken on a greater level of urgency, establishing a new household rule that no parties would be attended by the couple unless they were for charity. Wallace also founded a clinic for women and young children, which involved a considerable amount of personal time and investment and dedicated herself to working for the airmen stationed in the region, many of whom later recalled the fact that they were served their breakfast by the Duchess of Windsor. This was work that she evidently seemed to enjoy and which gave her a sense of purpose and duty, which she relished. Indeed, this excitement and sense of purpose made her position in the Bahamas all the harder to bear, since she felt that she had been isolated from the war and was keen to do more to help in the combined effort. This mood worsened when the couple heard that Prince George, Edward's younger brother, had been killed in a plane crash along with his wife in August 1942. The couple 
had always been caring and understanding towards Wallace and Edward, and their death had left a bitter sting. The couple remained isolated and were upset that they had routinely been so well received in America but snubbed in Canada and the UK. Whilst both remained eager to leave the Bahamas, they were concerned that if they returned to England, they would once again be ostracized. This situation worsened in March 1941, when Edward gave an interview to the American Liberty magazine, in which he expressed again the view that some sort of negotiated peace should be arranged between the Allies and Germany. This infuriated Churchill, who had maintained that an outright victory was possible and should be regarded as the goal. Towards the end of the war, there was a slackening in the government's hold over the couple, and Churchill began inquiring as to whether there were any jobs in the British Embassy in Washington which could engage the Duke, a plan which was shot down by Ernest Bevan, the Foreign Secretary. Nonetheless, the couple left the Bahamas on the 3rd of May 1945 and went to the US without any defined plan of where they should live or what they should do. Edward and Wallace remained in limbo for the following six years and remained, in the words of Wallace, homeless on the face of the earth. They rented and stayed in homes for the duration of this period, deciding that it would be untenable for them to return to England, with Wallace instead entertaining the idea that they could return to France, where she would be able to create a home for the Duke which could give him some stability. The couple did return to England in 1946, but the trip had been a disaster. Wallace had £25,000 worth of jewellery stolen during the night of the 16th of October, an event which turned the attention of the British press on them once again, ruining any hopes they had entertained of a quiet trip. The aftermath of this was not only the loss of many of her jewels, but the resurgence of an admonition in the press for the excess and vanity of the couple, particularly Wallace. By 1952, the couple had decided they should move to France, settling in a home in gif sur yvette south of Versailles and just outside of Paris. They also had a rented home in the centre of the city, on which they spent a fortune renovating. In February 1952, news reached the couple that the king, George VI, had died of lung cancer. The duke went along to attend his brother's funeral, and the subsequent accession of Elizabeth II did little to alter the relationship between Edward, Wallace, and the royal family. Wallace and Edward generated an income for themselves, largely through writing. Edward first for Life magazine, and then through a memoir called A King's Story and Wallace, through her memoir, The Heart Has Its Reasons. Both works were well received, and Wallace's writing was regarded as open and honest, which won her friends in the literary world, such as Maxine Sandberg. Opinions on Wallace varied massively between those who met her during this period. The daughter of Fruity Metcalf remarked that Wallace was an incredibly kind and loving person, whereas the publisher of her book, Charles Pick, stated that she was a rather brittle, hard and vain person. When Queen Mary, Edward's mother, died in March 1953, Edward once again travelled along to England in order to attend her funeral, and wrote back to Wallace expressing his sadness that her rejection of him and his wife had remained with her until the very end, penning my sadness is mixed with incredulity that any mother could have been so hard and cruel toward her eldest son for so many years. I'm afraid the fluids in her veins have always been as icy cold as they are now in death. The life that the Duke and Duchess fell into was one of boredom and repetition. They attended dinners, went shopping, occasionally appeared at charity events, both became obsessed with their weight and eventually ate as little as a single piece of fruit for lunch, nothing 
besides black tea and juice for breakfast and tiny portions of meat for dinner, which would often be left untouched. Many others commented that Wallace and Edward had grown more bitter in exile, with one diplomat recalling that upon dropping her handbag, Wallace hadn't thanked him when he stopped to pick it up, instead commenting, I like to see the British groveling to me. Many more commented on the dynamic of the relationship that the Duke and Duchess had with one another, that whilst she treated him often with condescension and irritability, he remained devoted and obsessed with her, his eyes following his wife around a room and becoming deeply sad when she was not present. The Duke of Windsor died on the 28th of May, 1972, after experiencing a brief but painful battle with throat cancer. Queen Elizabeth II had mandated that both he and Wallace could be buried together in the royal grounds at Frogmore, and Wallace travelled to England for the funeral, during which time she was permitted to stay at Buckingham Palace, where she remarked that even now the attitude of the royals remained cold towards her. Wallace returned to Paris alone and travelled to England only once more, to lay flowers at Edward's grave and to have tea with the Queen at Windsor. Her life in France was lonely, and one of her only points of solace was a letter written to her by Charles, the then Prince of Wales, who spoke of his admiration for his uncle, which, for a time, allowed her to entertain the thought that relations between her and the family might improve. The Duchess soon experienced a decline in her health, which led her to act as if the Duke was still alive talking to him and even imploring him not to abdicate. By 1975, she had suffered a significant deterioration and spent much of her time traveling to and from the hospital. She died on the 24th of April, 1986, in Paris. Her funeral service was held in St. George's Chapel at Windsor and was attended by around 200 people. It was remarked that many of the flowers which adorned her coffin were sent not by friends, but by Van Cleef and Dior, the fashion and jewellery houses which she had patronised for so much of her life, and she was laid to rest alongside the Duke of Windsor. Wallace Simpson is remembered as an ambitious woman who was driven to advance her own standing and interests which she managed to achieve, albeit often at the expense of other people, such as Mary Kirk and Ernest Simpson. Wallace was undoubtedly an adventurous and brave person. The periods in her life when she was alone saw her travel to new and sometimes dangerous places, eager to have new experiences and meet new people. She loved the social scene and was fearless in her self-expression even when this met with the disapproval of royals and social elites. Her life was also marked with a high degree of strife. Her difficult childhood and financial subjugation to her uncle was followed by an abusive and controlling first marriage, soon followed by a second which, whilst stable, left her lonely and bored. Her relationship with Edward was one in which she often felt trapped and powerless, as demonstrated by her numerous recorded wishes to leave. Her third marriage lost her many of her friends, and she was left to lead a life marked by isolation and exile, with a man who was obsessive over her. Wallace was socially tone-deaf at times in her life, and her love of finery was often at odds with the political and social situation. This was suggestive of a person who was out of touch with the experiences of a population battered by war and financial difficulty. She was also, however, a dedicated servant, and threw a great deal of time and effort into her work with the Red Cross, and as an official in the Bahamas, for which she was kindly remembered, by many service people. What do you think of Wallace Simpson? Was she portrayed unfairly during her lifetime? 
Or should she be remembered as a cunning and ambitious social climber with limitless ambition? Please, let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as King Edward VIII of the United Kingdom and Emperor of India was born on the 23rd of June 1894 at White Lodge, Richmond Park in Surrey, England. His father was George, the eldest son of Edward, Prince of Wales, the son and heir of Queen Victoria of Britain. As Victoria was into her mid-70s by the time young Edward was born in 1894, it was clear that her son, the future Edward VII, Prince of Wales, and Edward's grandfather, would soon succeed her. That would place the young Edward as second in line to the throne when it occurred, which it soon did when Victoria died in January 1901. Young Edward's mother was Mary of Teck, the daughter of the Duke of Teck, a senior German. Between them, George and Mary had six children, five boys and one girl. Edward was the eldest, but nearly as consequential as the years went by was the next eldest child, a boy named Albert after his great-grandfather, Victoria's long-deceased husband, over whose death she had never fully recovered. Edward's full name was Edward, Albert, Christian, George, Andrew, Patrick, David. And during his youth, he was always referred to within the family as David. Edward was raised from his very youngest years as a future king. He would no doubt not ascend to the throne for several decades, but accidental deaths and illnesses had created a situation where a person in line to the throne in the way Edward was could sometimes ascend at a very young age. His parents were aloof and somewhat gruff in their parenting methods, but it was not a wholly unhappy household, though Edward grew to become wary of his father's angry outbursts about relatively unimportant issues. He later stated in his memoirs that he felt unloved, and his childhood experiences seemed to have inculcated in him a desire to avoid having children in later life, which he never would. More broadly, Edward became known for having an easy charm in his younger years, which allowed him to mix freely with members of different classes, though his intellect was hardly prodigious. In these younger years, he and his siblings were largely educated at home at York Cottage at Sandringham and at Frogmore near Windsor Castle. As he entered his teenage years, Prince Edward was sent to the Naval College at Osborne on the Isle of Wight. This was a virtually identical training to that which his father had undertaken in his younger years, and which indeed has remained a staple of royal princes ever since. Despite being an heir to the throne, Edward was not overly protected and experienced some bullying in his youth in the Navy. Otherwise, his upbringing was somewhat limited. He was not trained to develop his mind or become a significant scholar in the same way in which his forebears in the 17th or 18th centuries might have been. As a result, he grew up with an intellectually limited worldview. This limited intellectual development was all the more concerning when, in May 1910, with the death of his grandfather, his father became king, and so Edward became heir to the throne at the age of 15. According to tradition, he was soon given the title of Prince of Wales, and despite still being a teenager, was quickly drawn into public life. The occasional appearances at public events were interspersed throughout the early 1910s with studies at the University of Oxford, which his father had decided Edward should attend. However, Edward proved an indifferent student, and when turmoil struck Europe towards the end of his time there, he was glad of the distraction. In the summer of 1914, war descended across Europe. 
It had been brewing for decades as the rise of a united Germany in the 1870s had destabilized the balance of power in Central Europe and created a major rival to Britain. Other issues such as rivalry for colonial possessions in Africa and fervent nationalist sentiment in the Balkans where the Empire of Austria-Hungary and the Russian Empire were rivals to secure control over the collapsing Ottoman Empire had compounded matters. In the end, it was a regional crisis here. In the summer of 1914, the assassination of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, by a Serb nationalist which lit the match that ignited the war. In the final days of July and the first week of August, Britain, France and Russia went to war with Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The major front for the British for the duration of what soon became known as the First World War was in northern France where the British and French were soon bogged down in attritional trench warfare with the Germans. As part of the effort by the royal family to show solidarity with the millions of British men who were now being conscripted into the military and sent to fight in France, Prince Edward and others were assigned to serve as officers in the army. Edward was commissioned into the Grenadier Guards in the last days of July 1914 and took to military service very well finding that he enjoyed the camaraderie in ways which his studies had not fulfilled him. However, his wartime experience can hardly be said to have been authentic. Neither Edward nor any other senior members of the royal family or major noble lines could be placed in harm's way where they might be captured or killed. As such, for much of the next four years he was effectively chaperoned by his fellow soldiers in roles across northern France. Some of these were tokenistic, such as when he was sent as a sort of royal ambassador to meet with French generals, but when he appeared to inspect British army camps on the Western Front, it is understood to have genuinely improved morale on the front. Here was a prince and a member of the royal family actively showing up to do his own military service. Indeed, on one or two occasions, despite the extensive precautions taken, Edward did find himself in danger during the war, notably when his chauffeur was killed by exploding artillery and his car crashed in northern France. Moreover, his range of activities extended beyond France with a visit to the Middle East in 1916 to meet and greet Britain's Australian and New Zealander allies. The war was significant in one other way which would have a small implication for Edward and his family for decades to come. At the outset of the conflict, the royal family was known as the House of saxe coburg and Gotha. This had been established in 1901 following the succession of King Edward VII, bringing the House of Hanover, which had ruled Britain for nearly two centuries, to an end. However, the House of saxe coburg and Gotha name, which was assigned on account of the extensive links between the British royal family and many of the most senior royal lines within Germany, became problematic in the context of the First World War. It reminded far too many people that the royals had extensive amounts of German blood and indeed George V was the first cousin of the German Kaiser Wilhelm II. In particular, when the Germans began dropping bombs on London in 1917 from planes named Gotha bombers, it was clear it was no longer tenable to retain the royal title. Consequently, in July 1917, the royal house's name was changed to that of the House of Windsor, a name adopted owing primarily to the long-standing associations between the English Crown and Windsor Castle to the west of London. The war was eventually won in November 1918, and so this name change had little consequence thereafter in practical terms. But the new Windsor name would become associated intimately with Edward in due course. The end of the war opened up the issue of Edward marrying and fathering an heir to secure the line of succession. However, Edward's father, unlike most other previous monarchs, was open to allowing Edward to decide his marital affairs for himself 
and the British public were more keen by the late 1910s and 1920s that some form of mutual affection should play a part in the selection of a future queen by the prince. Edward was not in any rush either. Rather, as the bloodshed of the 1910s gave way to the economic boom and social excesses of the 1920s, Edward became a regular attender at London nightclubs and dance halls where an entourage attached themselves to the future king. He also began an affair with Winifred Dudley Ward, who was already married with two small children to William Dudley Ward, the grandson of Lord Isha in the British nobility. Eventually, Ward divorced her husband and the affair became extremely serious in the 1920s, although Edward did also see several other women intermittently throughout these years. However, the relationship with Ward would never result in marriage, even after she divorced her first husband, and it was eventually ended by Edward in 1934. This penchant for the high life and Edward's complicated love life had created concerns within the government and amongst the royals themselves during the 1920s. Compounding this was what was perceived as Edward's quasi-egalitarian manners and habits. During his time in military service during the war, the prince had become used to trying to find common ground with the rank-and-file soldiers, and he continued his efforts to do so during royal visits abroad to Canada and other regions in the 1920s. His easy manner with ordinary people would be viewed positively in a member of the royal family today, but in the interwar period, nearly a century ago, the royals, senior politicians, and the nobles of the realm looked at this disapprovingly. Moreover, many looked at Edward as a monarch who might try to exercise too much political independence when he became king, rather than a figure who would carry out the ceremonial duties of being monarch, which was effectively what the monarchy had been in England since the early 18th century. Thus, Already by the late 1920s, there was growing concern about the prince's behavior and attitudes within senior political circles, ones which were no doubt expressed in private when King George developed a serious illness which lasted for several months in 1928 and 1929. He recovered and would reign for several more years, but there were worrying signs of a clash between his successor and the political realm in years to come. In the early 1930s, Edward met the woman who would determine the course of the remainder of his life. Wallace Simpson was an American socialite from Pennsylvania who was born as Bessie Wallace Warfield. Two years Edward's junior, she had grown up in Baltimore and she and her mother had been supported by wealthy extended family members after her father died during her youth. In 1916, she had married Earl Winfield Spencer Jr., an American Air Force pilot. It was a fractious marriage, and while it lasted over a decade, long before they eventually divorced in 1927, the pair had spent extended periods of time apart. The following year, Wallace married Ernest Simpson, an American by birth who had developed extended business connections in Britain. As a result of his business dealings, the Simpsons were largely living in England by the early 1930s, where Wallace was moving in high society circles. Much of their social ascent was a mirage, though, and Ernest Simpson's business affairs had run into serious trouble following the Wall Street crash of 1929 and the Great Depression which followed. This undoubtedly placed some strain on his and Wallace's marriage in the early 1930s, around the time that she was first introduced to Prince Edward. 1934 was a pivotal year in the development of the relationship between the Prince and Wallace Simpson. That year, he decided to end his sporadic affairs with Frieda Dudley Ward and other mistresses such as Lady Furness. Curiously enough, his fascination with Mrs. Simpson seems to have derived from her being the more dominant individual within the relationship. Edward maintained a childlike personality throughout his adult life, and Simpson, as so many reports of the mid-1930s would assert, seemed to have the prince completely under her thumb. 
For his part, Edward was clearly besotted by her, and it seems evident that by 1934 or 1935, he had determined to marry her and for Simpson to become queen consort one day. There were early signs that this would not prove possible, though. When Edward introduced his American lover to his father and mother, they were not impressed, and indeed, there were even special branch police assigned to monitor the couple's movements from 1935 onwards. There were two major issues at hand, the first being the fact that Simpson was a divorcee, and on religious and moral grounds it would be disapproved of for the future King of England to marry such a woman and for her to become Queen. Simpson's American background and reports that she had excessive influence over Edward were also paramount in the minds of worried observers in the mid-1930s. The question of who would become Queen Consort became a pressing one before too long. On the 20th of January 1936, at 70 years of age, King George V died, and Edward was proclaimed as King Edward VIII the following day. At first, there were positive signs. George V had been an ill man for many years, and his chronic respiratory problems had often taken from his ability to serve as monarch. Moreover, he was perceived in the public eye as an antiquated figure, one who belonged more to the world of the late 19th century than the new emerging world of the interwar period. This public enthusiasm for a new monarch after a long reign ends was not an entirely unusual feature of British political life, but in Edward's case, it would prove unfounded. The new king seems to have given almost no thought to how he would reign when he succeeded his father. Nevertheless, it quickly became clear that Edward was the polar opposite of his father inasmuch as he had very little interest in the actual affairs of state. Ministers would present him with documents and state papers, which he would give almost no attention to. Rather, he seemed to be content to carry on his life much as he had before including maintaining an active social schedule in London. Within weeks, many at Westminster and elsewhere were troubled by what they saw. Edward's distracted nature was all the more worrying because when George V died, it was a moment of some considerable difficulty in world politics. The legacy of the First World War was immense. In Eastern Europe, the Russian Revolution had broken out in 1917 and resulted, after many years of civil war, in the emergence of the Soviet Union as a major world power, one which was ideologically opposed to nations like Britain. In the Far East, the Empire of Japan was ascendant as the dominant power there, and several years earlier, in 1931, had begun aggressively expanding on the Asian mainland by conquering the Chinese province of Manchuria. In Western Europe, Spain was about to descend into a vicious civil war after years of instability, whilst elsewhere on the continent, fascist regimes and authoritarian governments had seized power in countries like Italy, Austria and Hungary. Compounding the growth of extremist politics was the economic crisis which began in 1929 with the Wall Street crash and which resulted in years of profound economic depression in the early 1930s. In this landscape, Britain was a bastion of relative stability. Edward's job as king would be to try to maintain this and Britain's empire in India and Africa. However, of all the problems which were confronting Europe, none was as great as that posed by Germany. The country had been left demoralized and destabilized by the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which had been imposed on the country by Britain and France in 1919. This reassigned large amounts of formerly German territory to its neighbors and imposed huge financial reparations on the country while also heavily restricting the size of its military. Nevertheless, after several years of crisis in the late 1910s and early 1920s, the German Republic had entered a period of relative stability in the mid-1920s and was the cultural center of the continent. 
But the economic crisis of the late 1920s and early 1930s hit Germany particularly badly. As it did, an extremist party, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazis, led by Adolf Hitler, managed to claim power early in 1933 after years of electoral gains. They soon turned Germany into a one-party dictatorship and, in the 12 months prior to Edward's accession, had begun aggressively rearming in contravention of the Treaty of Versailles. One might have expected that Edward's reign would be characterized by opposition to Nazi aggression, but events were quickly to ensure that the reign was brief and Edward was soon cozying up to the Germans in ways which have cast a shadow over his entire life ever since. Edward was known to sympathize with elements of the Nazi regime in Germany, an issue which would create untold controversy before too long, but the more pressing issue in the first months of his reign was that of his relationship with Mrs. Simpson. At first, it was not clear how much difficulty this would create. But when the foreign newspapers began covering the new king's holiday on a yacht on the Mediterranean with Simpson shortly into his reign, unease began to emerge amongst government ministers in London. When it then became clear that Wallace Simpson was in the latter stages of finalizing the divorce from her second husband, the government of Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin had to begin to take a stance on matters. Baldwin was not naturally inclined to be interventionist on matters of this kind. He was often seen to be a vacillating Prime Minister who delayed making major decisions to an excessive degree. Additionally, he personally liked Edward and was not overly enthusiastic about interceding with him on the matter of his possible marriage. He prevaricated for as long as possible, but eventually he requested to see the king on the 20th of October 1936, possibly on account of having learned some days beforehand of Wallace's intentions to finally divorce her long-suffering husband. When they met on the 20th of October, Baldwin informed the king that an embargo on press reports of the new monarch, which was legally enforced at the time following a new coronation, was about to expire. Once it was, it would become impossible to prevent the newspapers and the wider public speculating massively on the king's relationship with Mrs. Simpson and whether he intended to marry her after she divorced. Accordingly, he advised the king that Wallace should avoid finalizing her divorce in the immediate term and absent herself from Britain for some time until the matter could be more thoroughly debated by all the relevant parties. The king fobbed Baldwin off, arguing that Wallace's marital status was a private matter, when clearly her divorce would have profound implications for British public life if she then went on to marry the king. Things spiraled from there. A week later, on the 27th of October, Wallace obtained her divorce, though she would not be free to marry again for over six months given the laws at the time. A week later, Edward, who had not yet been crowned as plans were still being made for his coronation, opened a new parliament. Unbeknownst to him, the government had already contacted his brother, the Duke of York, with a view to preparing him for the possibility of succeeding his brother if the issue of the divorce led to him having to abdicate. Baldwin met with the king again on the 16th of November. At this audience, Edward admitted to a senior member of the government for the first time that he intended to marry Wallace the following summer, once it became legally possible to do so. By that time, Baldwin's government had begun canvassing opinions from both within Britain and the Dominion states, which were still ruled as part of the British Empire. These indicated that there would be strong hostility to the idea of a monarch taking as his queen a woman who was twice divorced, primarily on religious and moral grounds. Baldwin was also aware that organizations such as the Church of England would be especially hostile within Britain itself. However, Baldwin was provided with a curious way out by Edward, 
who asserted that if the government was determined to prevent him from marrying Wallace, he would abdicate rather than spurn her. He had informed his immediate family members of the same by the end of the 18th of November. Thereafter, two weeks of inaction largely followed, during which the major development was the emergence of a proposal that a morganatic marriage could be entered into between Edward and Wallace, whereby she would become his wife, but not the Queen Consort. This, however, would have required a parliamentary decree and would open the monarchy up to extensive debate in Parliament, a development which nobody welcomed either within the government or in the royal family. The conclusion to the growing constitutional crisis was swift when it came. Baldwin began consulting the cabinet and the secretaries of the dominions in the last days of November and by early December, it was clear that nobody was in favor of Edward continuing as king if he married Wallace. Moreover, press silence was crumbling by then and discussion of the matter was becoming widespread. On the 3rd of December, Wallace temporarily left for France to avoid overt press speculation. Yet this did little to allay Baldwin's government, who were now insisting that Edward needed to abdicate the throne if he was set on marrying Simpson. This is duly what Edward did a week later, signing the official instrument on the 10th of December, despite being encouraged by several individuals such as Winston Churchill to fight for his rights as king. King Edward VIII abdicated his position as monarch on the 11th of December 1936. At 327 days, it was the shortest reign of any English monarch since the late 15th century. Edward's speech to the nation, in which he declared that he was renouncing his crown of his own volition in order to marry the woman he loved and had not been coerced into his actions by the government, was something of a high point for Edward, one which was perceived as being dignified and statesmanlike. The years that followed would not see a repetition of such behavior. There remained the final issue of what title the former king and his soon-to-be wife would bear. On the 13th of December 1936, the same day that Edward officially announced his abdication, his brother and successor proposed that Edward and Wallace would henceforth carry the titles of Duke and Duchess of Windsor, the royal family name which had been adopted back in 1917. In tandem, the Duke and Duchess were given extensive financial privileges and a lavish salary and estates. However, the royal family now began a process of cutting off the former king and his new wife. As late as the 1940s, other members of the family and the king himself continued to refer to Wallace coldly as simply Mrs. Simpson. This was despite the fact that Edward and she had married at the Chateau de Candé near Tours in France on the 3rd of June 1937. The nuptials were not attended by any of the royal family and other than a note of congratulations from Baldwin's government were largely ignored on an official level in Britain. Moreover, it was in France where they would spend much of their lives from that time, generally living either in Paris or a country retreat. The rest of the royal family were delighted by this exile and the general tenor in Britain was that everyone wished to forget the brief kingship of Edward in 1936 and the constitutional crisis which it had aroused. Edward and Wallace settled in Paris and began leading a relatively rich lifestyle based on the funds which Edward had been paid to relinquish his ownership of several royal residences in England as part of the abdication agreement. During this time, he rang his brother, the new king, every few days, often imploring George VI that his wife should be allowed to have the title Her Royal Highness in recognition of her position as the wife of a former king of Britain. However, this was refused. The concern in London being that Wallace would continue to use such a title at some future date, even if she divorced Edward. Meanwhile, the newlyweds continued to enjoy Paris life, but they appeared to have harbored the view at this stage that this was a temporary exile. 
They soon received messages from England which put them straight concerning this notion, making it clear that it would be in everyone's best interest if they stayed in Paris and away from Britain. As the extent of the rebuff he was now suffering dawned on Edward, he began concocting ways to carve out a new place in the public life of Europe. While many individuals might have wished to retreat from the public eye as quickly as possible and attempt to lead a quieter life for some time, given the bruising experience of Edward's brief kingship, he and Wallace quickly entered into the most controversial episode of the former king's life. As we have seen, the early 1930s had witnessed the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis to power in Germany. Now, shortly after his abdication, Edward accepted an offer to visit Germany. This must be viewed in context. Many individuals visited Germany in the mid-1930s as they wished to see exactly what was taking place there and how the Nazis had so rapidly overhauled the country and pulled it out of the economic crisis of the early 1930s. For instance, the former British Prime Minister David Lloyd George who had been the head of state in Britain from 1916 to 1922, had visited the country in late 1936 as the constitutional crisis concerning Edward was playing out at home. In assessing any of these visits, it is important to remember that many British people in the mid-1930s viewed Hitler as an important bulwark against the development of a communist state in Germany and secondly, that individuals like Lloyd George did not know when they decided to visit Germany the horrors which the Nazis would unleash across Europe a few short years later. The offer to visit Germany was extended to Edward in the late summer of 1937 from Dr. Robert Ley, the head of the German Labour Front, an organization which had been set up by the Nazis in Germany to replace the trade unions and stymie any socialist agitation in the country. The offer was extended from this body as figures like Edward and Lloyd George the year beforehand were being invited to the country principally to view how Germany had overcome its economic woes and was running its factories through bodies like the Labour Front. Edward accepted seemingly based on a desire to rejuvenate his profile in the aftermath of his kingship. A tour of the United States was also planned, and he seems to have developed the idea that he could act as an individual who might foster new ideas about how to avoid political conflicts across the Western world like those which had engulfed Spain and cast it into civil war. Essentially, Edward wanted to visit Germany to see how the further spread of communism and radical socialism could be avoided. Thus, by the early autumn of 1937, he had accepted the offer and news of the impending visit was relayed to the British ambassador in Berlin, George Ogilvy Forbes. The tour commenced on the morning of the 11th of October when the Windsors arrived at Friedrichstrasse station in Berlin. Despite being billed as a private tour rather than a royal visit, the couple were met at the station not just by Robert Ley, but by Joachim von Ribbentrop as well, who was soon to be appointed as the German foreign minister and still held the title of German ambassador to the United Kingdom. The trip thereafter lasted for 12 days down to the 23rd of October. Much of it consisted, as Lloyd George's had the previous year, of visits to German factories and various government installations. These went from the mundane, such as a tour of a light bulb factory, to the sinister, notably a trip to a newly built concentration camp which the Windsors were admittedly deceived as to its true purpose. Other visits included ones to Hitler Youth Academies and factories belonging to major German companies like Krupps. The dominant theme throughout was to present an image of efficient German industry with well-run factories, a nation that had returned to work after the economic difficulties of the early 1930s, and happy and enthusiastic workers. There were also considerable efforts made to highlight Britain's cultural closeness to Germany 
with the two nations' national anthems being played whenever Edward and Wallace arrived at a factory or academy. The goal throughout was to impress on the couple that Germany was a model for how to prevent the spread of radical socialism on the continent and that the Nazis were natural allies of the British. Throughout their visit, the Windsors met with several of the most senior members of the Nazi regime. For instance, on their first evening in Berlin, the couple were brought to dinner at Horsher's, a popular haunt of the Nazi senior leadership in the capital, by von Ribbentrop, along with the German architect and later Minister of Armaments, Albert Speer, and the Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, and his wife, Magda. More controversially, Edward and Wallace met Hermann Göring, the head of the newly formed German Air Force and Hitler's second-in-command at his hunting estate outside Berlin on the 14th of October. This included a meeting in Göring's study where the Nazi minister had a map of Central Europe on the wall, one which depicted Austria as forming part of a Nazi-controlled Greater Germany. Despite the implication that Germany intended to take over an independent neighbor before long, Edward did not raise any objections. When this was combined with news of the Duke and Duchess visiting armaments factories where German tanks, armored vehicles, and submarines were clearly being constructed, and Edward's offering of the Nazi salute to many officials during the trip, it is not difficult to see how concerns arose surrounding it and endured thereafter. If the impression conveyed to contemporaries and to posterity by the Windsor's near two-week stay in Germany were not bad enough, it culminated with a personal meeting between Hitler and Edward on the 22nd of October. This occurred at the Berghof, the Nazi leader's alpine retreat on the southern border between Germany and Austria. There are varying accounts of the meeting and the subsequent conversation after Wallace joined them later on. For instance, some suggest it was a rather insignificant meeting with social niceties expressed, some vague feelings of amity between the German and British nations swapped and compliments exchanged, followed by tea. Others, though, have claimed that Edward indicated his active support for Germany's increasingly aggressive foreign policy and Hitler's desire to acquire lands in Austria, Czechoslovakia and Poland. There certainly is no suggestion that the former king attempted to discourage German expansionism. Finally, when the meeting had concluded, the former king and the German chancellor departed by giving each other the Nazi salute. Unsurprisingly, the issue of what may or may not have been discussed in Germany during the Windsor's visit, especially during Edward's meetings with Hitler, Goering and others, have aroused considerable controversy. Some have suggested that discussion veered into talk of Edward facilitating an alliance between Germany and Britain as Germany expanded on the continent and prevented a further rise of communism. These theories have been fueled by the fact that the minutes of the meeting between Hitler and Edward on the 22nd of October were subsequently destroyed. What did they contain that warranted their destruction? Other evidence is open to interpretation. For instance, on the final night of their tour, the Windsors were entertained in Munich by Rudolf Hess, Hitler's long-standing private secretary, and his wife Ilse. At one point, Rudolf and Edward disappeared for about an hour, leaving behind their interpreters and all other staff. An hour later, they were found upstairs. Rudolf was allegedly showing Edward his collection of model ships, but was he really? Or was something more sinister being discussed? While there is extensive disagreement amongst historians about the trip, what has been universally accepted by biographers of Edward and historians of the royals in the mid-20th century is that it demonstrated a startling lack of judgment on the former king's part, one which has forever shrouded his life in ignominy. And it didn't just end when the Windsors departed from Germany on the 23rd of October 1937. As we will see, fresh rumours and concerns abounded during the Second World War, ones which Edward and Wallace did nothing to dispel. Following their trip to Germany, Edward and Wallace returned to Paris, 
where they rented a mansion on the Boulevard Souchet, in which they lived in the late 1930s. As they were settling there, the Germans were intensifying their aggression on the world stage. Already, during their visit to Germany in 1937, Hitler had been applying ever greater pressure on Austria to force it into a political union with Berlin. The Anschluss, creating a greater Germany, was finally achieved in March 1938 in violation of the Versailles Treaty. Within weeks, Hitler was pressing the case for the annexation of the Sudetenland, a part of Western Czechoslovakia with a largely ethnic German population. At a conference in Munich in September 1938, Britain and France caved in to Hitler's demands, but insisted that any further Nazi attempts at expansion at the expense of Germany's neighbors would result in war. Hitler called that bluff in the spring of 1939 when he annexed the rest of Czechoslovakia and the city of Memel in the Baltic States region. However, when German tanks rolled over the border into Poland at the very beginning of September 1939, appeasement could no longer be allowed. Britain and France declared war two days later as the Second World War commenced. For the former king and his wife in France, they, like everyone else in the country, must have assumed a German invasion would come soon. However, as the autumn turned into winter and then 1940 dawned with Poland long conquered by the Germans and no westward campaign having occurred, many began to talk of a phony war. The spring robbed Europe of such hopes. In April 1940, the Nazis invaded Denmark and tactically occupied the key cities and towns of Norway. Just weeks later, an invasion of the Low Countries and France was initiated. This action aroused fresh concerns about Edward, who was accused by some British diplomats of having leaked information to Berlin, which had facilitated the German assault on Belgium. The accusation was especially damning when the British expeditionary force to France became trapped at the town of Dunkirk in late May as a result of the unexpected success of the German two-pronged assault of Belgium and northeast France. Only a daring amphibious rescue operation prevented hundreds of thousands of British troops from either being obliterated or captured. The French, though, were not so lucky. And on the 14th of June 1940, Paris was occupied by the Nazis. The city, and France in general, would remain under German control for the next four years. Notwithstanding their earlier friendliness towards the Nazis, the Duke and Duchess were the targets of a conspiracy by Hitler and the Nazi paramilitary organization, the SS, in the summer of 1940. The goal of what was codenamed Operation Veli was to kidnap the Windsors, who had left Paris when France was invaded in May 1940, heading south to Biarritz and then journeying over the border into Spain, with the ultimate goal of reaching Portugal. Operation Veli was conceived while they were traveling through Spain, which, under the fascist dictatorship of General Francisco Franco, was friendly towards Hitler's government. The idea was that the Duke would be kidnapped, brought to Germany, and then his alleged pro-German inclinations would be fostered with a view to re-establishing him as King of England, following the German defeat of Britain in the war. By the time plans were at an advanced stage, the Windsors had already crossed into Portugal and were living in Lisbon by the first days of July 1940. At this juncture, a new plan was settled on, whereby Edward would be tricked into crossing back into Spain and detained there. But even Walter Schellenberg, the SS official who was placed in charge of the operation and who subsequently became the head of Nazi foreign intelligence, later conceded that the plan was ludicrous. Operation Vili was never brought to fruition, but the arrival of the Windsors in Lisbon and the ever-present lack of tact displayed by Edward and Wallace on their arrival there opened them up to further charges of engaging in traitorous activity, ones which, like their visit to Germany in 1937, 
have created long-lasting suspicions which have never been entirely resolved. The Windsors had apparently elected to make their way to Spain and Portugal in May 1940 owing to anxieties about their diminished status in Britain and certain tax burdens which would fall on them if they returned home. Back in Britain, this failure to return to England looked very bad and the new Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, looked at it particularly disapprovingly. Matters only became more suspicious when the Windsors arrived in Portugal and promptly accepted an offer to stay in the home of Ricardo Espirito Santo, a Portuguese banker who had extensive business connections in Germany and who was suspected of having sufficient contacts with Hitler and the Nazis that MI6, the British intelligence service, had opened a file on him. Perhaps Edward and Wallace were unaware of this, but it seems unlikely, and in accepting the offer to stay with Santo, the former king was either involved in talks with Santo, or else was acting in an incredibly irresponsible manner, one which almost guaranteed that his loyalty would be questioned. Yet, there was worse still. Recent research has revealed that while he was in Portugal, Edward promoted the idea through Ricardo Espirito Santo that the Nazis should, quote, bomb Britain into peace. Edward here was apparently proposing that the Nazis should adopt a strategy of aerial bombing over England and London, in particular, in order to force the British government into surrendering without the necessity of a land invasion. This was effectively the strategy which the Germans adopted in the summer of 1940, leading to the Blitz of London and England for the next year. This recent study has highlighted how Edward had proposed the Blitz while in Portugal, and that the same advice was then conveyed to the Nazi government in Berlin by the German ambassador in Lisbon. It is possible that Edward viewed this as the lesser of two evils compared to a land invasion, but there is still absolutely no denying that coming from a member of the royal family, this advice constituted treason of the highest kind. In the months that followed, tens of thousands of bombs were dropped on Britain, leading to approximately 40,000 civilian deaths. In September and October 1940 alone, London was bombed almost every single night. Edward seemingly advocated that Berlin should adopt this strategy in order to force the country into surrendering and to make him King of Britain again in the aftermath of the capitulation. Edward's possible duplicity while in Lisbon did not end along with his brief sojourn in Portugal. As soon as he and Wallace arrived there, Churchill had taken steps to remove Edward from continental Europe while also avoiding bringing him back to Britain. He could not have the Duke residing on the continent and possibly falling into Nazi hands. The possibility that he would collude with the Nazis and potentially work out a deal to be made King of England once again was now too great. At the same time, Edward's actions in fleeing to Portugal and in visiting Germany back in 1937 made him a liability if he were to be brought back to England. Accordingly, Churchill had a statement sent to Lisbon that Edward had been appointed as the new governor of the Bahamas, the British island colony north of Cuba. Edward eventually accepted the position and he and Wallace departed from Portugal on the steamship the Excalibur on the 1st of August 1940. However, two weeks after leaving Portugal, Edward engaged in possibly his most incriminating behavior yet. On the 15th of August, he sent a telegram to Espirito Santo, his and Wallace's Portuguese host, asking him to send word as soon as he needed to act. When this document was made public in 1957, Edward dismissed the significance of it. But here would seem to be evidence that Edward wanted to be updated by a known German agent of any developments which might lead to him returning to Europe to be installed as a puppet king of England if Germany defeated Britain in the war. 
Suspicions about Edward and his wife's actions over the past several years were still considerable enough that when the couple decided to visit the United States from the Bahamas in the spring of 1941, they were monitored by the Federal Bureau of Investigation at the behest of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. J. Edgar Hoover's FBI was acting on information supplied by a German monk living in the U.S., who claimed to have information that Wallace Simpson had been the lover of Joachim von Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister back in 1936 when he had served as the Nazi ambassador to Britain. Suspicions were also aroused by a different English informant who claimed that Edward had made an arrangement with Hermann Göring that if the war ended in German victory, Göring would then attempt to overthrow Hitler and subsequently install Edward as King of England. How much of any of this was based on solid information and how much was just the wild imaginings of FBI informants is very difficult to know, but it is indicative of the concern which attached itself to Edward and Wallace during the war years that they were shadowed by FBI agents during this first visit to Florida from the Bahamas in 1941, and again on several further occasions after the US entered the war in December 1941. We may never be able to disentangle fact from fiction when it comes to Edward's dealings with the Nazis, but we can be sure of one thing. Any plot which he might have been engaged in did not materialize. Instead, Edward and Wallace spent the period from the autumn of 1940 through to the end of the war in 1945 largely ensconced in the Bahamas, a region which Edward dismissively referred to as a third-rate colony. He was contemptuous of the natives, whom he viewed as racially inferior to their colonial overlords, and as a consequence, might have been the worst individual imaginable to have been charged with quietening serious riots over low wages across the islands, which occurred in the summer of 1942. However, Edward handled these diplomatically and as governor of the island introduced a policy of poor relief and public works to try to both develop the islands and assuage ill will against crown rule. Nevertheless, he and Wallace were eager to leave what they considered to be a colonial backwater to which they had been banished, and in mid-March 1945, months before the war ended, the former king resigned his commission as governor of the island archipelago. While Edward and Wallace spent their time in the Bahamas and being trailed in the US by FBI agents, the war effort began to turn against the Germans. Hitler had decided to suspend efforts to conquer Britain late in 1940 and instead turned his attention towards the Soviet Union. A massive invasion, the largest in the history of warfare, was initiated in the summer of 1941. That winter, the German Third Reich reached its greatest extent as German troops reached Moscow and Leningrad. But they failed to take the cities and by 1942, Russian resistance had turned the war into stalemate on the Eastern Front. Thereafter, Germany's position collapsed gradually as resources ran out. The US entry into the war late in 1941 began to have an impact and the infinitely superior manpower of the Soviet Union became the deciding factor on the Eastern Front. By the summer of 1943, the Russians were pushing the Germans back towards Poland and Ukraine, and the Western Allies successfully opened a new front in southern Italy. By the time the Western Front was opened in the summer of 1944 by the Western Allies in France, it was really a matter of who would reach Berlin first. The Soviets from the East, or the British and Americans from the West. In the end, it was the Russians with the Western Allies occupying Western and Southern Germany. The war came to an end in early May 1945, days after Hitler killed himself in Berlin. In the immediate aftermath of the war, despite the many unanswered questions which still hung over Edward's conduct both in the years leading up to the war and during it, he was not overtly criticized within the British press. Nevertheless, 
there was a clear desire for both he and Wallace to resume the arrangement which had been in place in the late 1930s. They would return to France and live there, rather than in Britain, where their presence could be problematic. However, even when they had settled again in Paris, as Europe was being rebuilt, another issue arose which allowed Edward to begin scheming once again. His brother, King George VI, was suffering ill health at a relatively young age owing to his chronic smoking. The possibility of his having to step aside or dying was already acute by the mid-1940s. From afar, Edward engaged in a correspondence with individuals in England in which he suggested that he could return to Britain and potentially serve as a regent for his young niece, Princess Elizabeth, whom he claimed would otherwise fall under the influence of her Mountbatten in-laws. The scheme never came to anything, and George would, in any event, live on until 1952, by which time Elizabeth was well into her mid-twenties. But it is indicative of the ceaselessly ambitious conniving of Edward that even after the ignominy which followed him in the aftermath of the war had developed, he continued to assess ways of re-entering British public life. Notably, he did not attend Elizabeth's coronation, but watched it on television from Paris. It was, though, to be the last of his forays in this regard. When Elizabeth did succeed and began a long and prosperous reign in 1952, her uncle and his wife resigned themselves to life in Paris. There, they became a sort of curious celebrity couple, the former King of Britain and his American wife, who had done so much to unsettle Britain's politics before the war. They hobnobbed with British expats in the city and engaged in France's post-war café society. Meanwhile, Edward supplemented the extensive income they had and financial perks which persisted from the arrangement reached with the British government in the late 1930s by engaging in illegal currency trading. He also took up his pen to author A King's Story, a memoir which was published in 1951 and set out his opposition to the species of liberal politics which were dominating the post-war world in Western Europe and North America. It was also the first book by a former or indeed sitting King of England to have been published since 1688. Furthermore, as the early 1950s turned into the mid to late 1950s, they began to visit the United States more frequently, socializing with politicians and celebrities and even visiting the White House during the presidency of Dwight Eisenhower. As such, they became a celebrity couple of sorts, albeit a curious one, but one which seemed to pose no further danger to the stability of public life back home in Britain. Wallace and Edward's relationship remained something of a mystery to many who commentated on it in the post-war period. Several who had spent time with them during the 1950s noted that they seemed very distant from one another, rarely addressing things to the other directly. It was a strange dynamic for a couple whose relationship had apparently been so intense 20 years earlier that Edward was willing to give up the crown for her. For a while in the mid-1960s, they returned to Britain and spent a considerable amount of time there attending various royal events, which occurred from 1965 onwards, notably the funeral of Princess Marina of Kent, who was Edward's sister-in-law through her marriage to his brother, who somewhat confusingly was also known as George, the same name as his brother, the King, who had adopted George as his regnal name, but had been christened Albert. Edward, like Marina, was not far away from the grave himself. By now, in his early 70s, he was facing a mounting number of health problems, most related to his chronic smoking. In between attending events in Britain in the mid-1960s, he regularly flew to America to attend doctors there and had a number of different surgical procedures carried out, notably to relieve his coronary problems. Eventually, the prince's lifetime smoking habit caught up with him. In the early 1970s, throat cancer was diagnosed. 
It was inoperable and terminal. By this time, he and Wallace had re-ensconced themselves in Paris. But though the former king did not have long left to live, he was able to receive a visit from his niece, Queen Elizabeth II, who fortuitously was on a state visit to France right around that time. Edward died on the 28th of May 1972 in Paris. His body was quickly removed to England, where it lay in state at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle rather than at Westminster Hall. Somewhat surprisingly, a large percentage of the British public filed by in the days that followed to pay their last respects to the king who had briefly ruled three and a half decades earlier. The funeral service was held on the 5th of June in the presence of Queen Elizabeth, the royal family, and Wallace Simpson. Thereafter, he was buried at the Royal Mausoleum at Frogmore. This was perhaps surprising, as there had been considerable speculation over the years as to where in Britain, if at all, Edward would be buried. In death, as in life, the former king was a subject of political intrigue. Edward's widow did not have a good life after his passing. Wallace continued to live in France and was financially supported by her late husband's estate and an allowance from Queen Elizabeth. But her health was declining and by the late 1970s, she was developing advanced dementia. She was also increasingly frail and prone to falling over, resulting in her breaking her hip twice, while from 1980 onwards, she lost the ability to speak. Thus, her later years were spent largely housebound and with her mental faculties sharply deteriorating. To compound matters, she was being taken advantage of by her French lawyer, Suzanne Blum, who assumed power of attorney for the increasingly incapacitated Wallace. Bloom used her position to exploit Simpson financially. Eventually, Wallace died in Paris on the 24th of April 1986 at 89 years of age. Her funeral was held a few days later at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. Her marriage to Edward, which had faced so many difficulties and aroused many different controversies, had survived the distance despite these adversities and she was interred next to him, near Windsor Castle. King Edward VIII was one of the most controversial figures in modern British public life. In 1936, he ascended to the throne of Britain and as Emperor of India when he was still a bachelor in his early 40s. However, while unmarried and without an heir, he was still an individual who had a varied love life. And that was the problem. Not only was the new king known for his extensive social life as Prince of Wales in the 1920s and 1930s, but he was also a figure of widespread gossip on account of his numerous dalliances with married women. One of these was problematic from the start of his brief reign. By 1934, Edward had become besotted with Wallace Simpson, an American who had already divorced once and who would need to do so again in order to marry Edward. When it became clear that that is exactly what the pair intended, it became a matter of national controversy. It has been widely debated ever since whether the issue of Simpson being a multiple divorcee was the real reason for Edward being forced to abdicate at the end of 1936, or if he was simply unpopular within political and social circles, and Simpson was used as a means to force him out in favour of the much more respectable George VI. Whatever the reason, the end product was the same. Edward abdicated, making him the shortest reigning monarch in nearly five centuries. Had matters rested there, we might look on Edward today as a sympathetic character, one who had the crown stolen from him owing to antiquated views on religion and marital morality which pertained in the 1930s. But what followed tarnished his reputation irreparably. In the autumn of 1937, Edward, who had always harbored sympathies towards the Nazi regime which had emerged in Germany in 1933, undertook a tour of the country, one in which he met with such odious characters as Hermann Goering, 
Joseph Goebbels, and finally, Adolf Hitler himself. There is no doubt Edward was in favor of fascism as a bulwark against socialism in Europe. What conspiracies might have been plotted in 1937 is unclear, but we do know that in 1940, when the Nazis quickly conquered France, Edward and Wallace's adopted home, the couple were involved with Nazi agents across Western Europe in the months that followed. Was Edward plotting to return as King of Britain in a Nazi-dominated Europe? We cannot be sure, but what is perfectly clear is that in acting in the way in which he did and opening himself up to the aspersions which he did, Edward forever tarnished himself as the possible traitor king. What do you think of King Edward VIII? Do you think he was conspiring as blatantly with Adolf Hitler and the German Nazi party as many believed? Or was he simply somebody who liked to arouse controversy? Please let us know in the comments section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.